Okay, everybody, I think it's time to start. So my name is Konstantinos Deltas. I am a professor of genetics with the medical school of the University of Cyprus. I live in Nicosia, Cyprus. And before I proceed, uh, I started recording the lecture. So please let me know you're listening to me and let me know you all agree uh, with recording the lecture. In case somebody disagrees of recording it, please let me know. Are people uh, listening to me? Am I heard well? Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I, I see there are positive answers for the recording. If somebody disagrees, please speak up because I have no way of seeing you. Okay, so uh, I, I am a geneticist and my field of expertise and everyday life deals with inherited disorders. Uh, my laboratory has been uh, working, doing research and diagnostics in inherited disorders for many, for many years. For, the, for this lecture today, I am going to talk to you about biobanking. Recently, my laboratory was funded by the European Commission to start a new center of excellence. Um, and the center of excellence revolves around biobanking. And this is what I am going to explain to you uh, what it's all about. So the title is what banking is all about and why investing in biobanking is investment in healthier societies. Okay. So biobanks are high quality and high capacity medical and research infrastructures that promote research studies to the benefit of all and high uh, societal impact. So they are infrastructures in, in themselves. They are not research laboratories. They are medical and research infrastructures which generate the right environment to promote research studies um, in, in, in several fields. But the field of my interest is the medical field. Biobanks are biorepositories of data and biological material, which are contributed voluntarily by fellow citizens. So people participate in these bio repositories voluntarily. Nobody is obliged or necessary to participate. It's absolutely voluntary. And if you, if you would like to be a volunteer donor to a biobank, you have to come up and, and contribute data about yourself and biological material, let's say blood. Donors are like uh, donors are people like you and me who decide entirely on a voluntary and altruistic basis to donate blood and information about their health status that can be used pseudonymized, double coded for a variety of research projects aimed at discovering new knowledge about diseases, improving disease diagnosis and treatment through promoting innovative medicines. So uh, people donate information and biological material which is pseudonymized or double coded. In other words, you cannot, uh, you, you, people who use this data and material do not know the identity of the donor because they are double coded or we say they are pseudonymized. Pseudonymized means you cannot identify them unless you have the, 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 the code to go back and identify uh, the, the donor, okay? So this is because we, we would like the donors to be, not to be identified by potential future researchers. Uh, the, the biobanks contain archived material of high quality that can be used by scientists around the world for genetics, or epidemiological studies in disparate fields of medicine, 
and anticipate the high societal impact in terms of the benefit to many. It's, uh, it's very important, and I will come back to that, that the, the way the data and material are kept and archived in the biobank are of high quality following high standards. Several years ago, the, the Time magazine had on its, uh, on its cover 10 ideas changing the world right now. And one of those ideas, number four, was biobanks. So biobanks are these medical and research infrastructures, which by their operation are really changing the world to the better. Why was I interested in presenting this topic today? Well, as I said, I, I operate in, in Cyprus and I was uh, the first one who took the initiative a number of years ago to start the first biobank in Cyprus. Uh, perhaps Cyprus was the last country in Europe that did not have its own, its own biobank. Cyprus is a small country in the southern eastern part of Mediterranean, uh, east, of, east of Greece and south of Turkey, with a population of less than a million people. And I started this biobank in 2011 with uh, funding I had from uh, the Cyprus Funding Authority. And then in 2019, we were funded by the European Commission to start a new center of excellence in research and innovation. Uh, our center of excellence is uh, focusing on biobanking and the Cyprus Human Genome Project. And the idea is to enhance and expand the biobank we had started and make it stronger and richer in uh, data and material. Uh, the total budget is 38 million euro for a duration of seven years by the European Commission and another eight years with um, complementary funding by the Republic of Cyprus and the University of Cyprus. The, obviously, the reason we were funded for this is because the European Commission and the evaluators thought that it's a good investment for the country of Cyprus to have this infrastructure as a, as a means to promote uh, research in the medical field and promote what I call the next generation of medical research in, in Cyprus. In this project, we have partners from, the, from Austria. It's the Medical University of Graz and the BMBMRI ERIC, which is a large family of biobanks in Europe and a small uh, and, and medium enterprise in Cyprus by the name Talos. The structure of our center of excellence, which comes by the name biobank.cy, is the following. We are operating under the University of Cyprus in Nicosia. There is a governance by the director, which is me, plus two councils, the academic council and the council of the center of excellence, which is more of a an advisory body and they have and then we have the stakeholders forum and an international scientific advisory committee of uh, five members and then we have two other ethics committees one is an internal ethics advisory committee and we also have an external ethics advisory committee with which we consult on sensitive issues relating to the bioethics of, of uh, developing research in humans. The Center of Excellence as a whole has five departments, five pillars. Number one, of course, is the Biobank. Number two is the Molecular Medicine Research Center, which is the, the research arm of the, of the center. We have the Department of Molecular Diagnostics, we have a pillar on continuous education and training, and then we have the research and innovation pillar for further development. The, 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 the heart of the, of the biobank is bidding in a room where we 
store the material. So for the time being, we have a room with eight large minus 80 degrees Celsius freezers and a liquid nitrogen tank where if you, if you open one of these freezers, you will see that there are two or three big shelves. And in every one of these shelves, there are uh, further divisions with lots of boxes where you can store small uh, uh, tubes with, with biological material, which can be DNA, plasma, serum, or, or, or urine. So in every one of these freezers, you can actually store many thousands of small aliquots of your biological material. And as I said, the temperature is maintained at minus 80 degrees Celsius. It is very important to, to note that there is um, digital storage in the Biobank information management system so that there is an easy way to know what you have in the, in the Biobank and how you use it. Having access to a biobank is very, very important for people in medical research. It's a, it's a tool, it's a means, uh, it's, a, it's a bio repository where you can get access to data and material and therefore boost your research. I, I, I usually say that having access to a biobank is like starting to run a marathon and while everybody's working, is waiting on the start line for the gunshot to, to run, you are already 10 kilometers uh, ahead because you had already access to a biobank and you had your material ready to start your research. So speaking of research, having access to ready-made uh, ready material at Dada, uh, it gains you, gains you uh, uh, space, it gains you uh, time, uh, because you already have material available to, to start your work instead of having to start collecting it from scratch. So many countries, I would say all European countries and many other countries around the world have their own biobanks. There are two general types of biobanks. One is biobanks which are hospital based. And therefore, hosp uh, many hospitals um, have their own uh, biobank for archiving material from the patients or even healthy volunteers who come to the hospital. And then there are biobanks which are not hospital based, like ours. Our biobank is located at the University of Cyprus and is not located within a hospital, or, although there are collaborations with, with the medical field, with the medical doctors, and of course, hospitals. Now, in another, from another perspective, there are biobanks which are archiving material and data from the general population. They do not select based on any criteria. They just collect samples and they take detailed data on the, on the personal data, demographic data, and clinical data of the donor, of the volunteer. And then there are disease-focused biobanks, which are interested specifically for cancer, for example, or heart conditions or kidney conditions or lung condi conditions or, or, or whatever, okay? So they are dedicated to archiving patients and material from specific diseases or groups of diseases. There may be biobanks, for example, archiving data and material from patients with breast cancer or prostate cancer only. Then there are biobanks which are project-based. This means that researchers who are interested in developing a specific project for a disease or groups of diseases, they start their own collection and they have their own specific aims and they collaborate with the biobank to archive their, their data and material. So there you have from, from, from the beginning, the researchers have specific objectives. Whereas in other situations, the objectives may vary depending on future research proposals that may come in and, and apply to use material from the biobank. 
And, and finally, uh, the material uh, that you use may, may be a reason to have a specific biobank, let's say for DNA, or have a biobank specifically for plasma, or serum, or urine, or hair, or something else. But, but normally in, a, in any biobank, uh, for any disease or for general population, the material people are interested in, in, in storing are usually DNA, of course, plasma, serum, urine, or, or, or else, or all of them together, or some of them, depending on uh, what somebody is interested in. But if you want to have a comprehensive, holistic approach, you would, write, you would like to, to store all of this biological material. So what do biobanks do? Biobanks are very well organized and they have people who take care of, very, uh, of every aspect of the biobank operation. Uh, so in order to operate a bank, you need administration, you need IT people who take care of the, of the storing of data in, in a safe way. You need nurses or doctors who take care of recruiting and enrolling the volunteers. And, and the volunteers can be healthy people or people who are affected with a specific disease. And then you need a, a, a team of biotechnologies who are taking care of the samples. The biotechnologies will, will receive the samples, uh, register the samples, process the samples, and store them in, in the biobank. And then you have other collaborators who are analyzing the data. So biobanks collect and store data and biological material to use in research, research studies. Uh, biobanks care about quality of data and material. Biobanks care about transparency, physical and digital safety and confidentiality of data. And they distribute data and material to ethically approved proposals to promote research. Every application that comes to the biobank to use material or data must be approved already by, a, by an appropriate ethics or, or IRB body from a hospital, a university, or a research center. Um, the biobank support disparate studies. Uh, they, they support studies that can be epidemiological studies, clinical trials, case control studies, prospective and follow-up studies, or, or, or others. Uh, different people have different interests. And uh, they, all, they, they can all have access to biobanks to use ready-made material data that's sitting there uh, available to, to be explored. Also, biobanks can serve as custodians to collections of other researchers. In other words, you may have your own research project and instead of you purchasing your own freezer and establishing your own procedures, you prefer to uh, collaborate with, with, the, with the, the biobank next to your hospital or next to your center to take care of the storing of material and data and retrieving of data whenever you, whenever you need them. What are the expected outcomes of the operation of a biobank? Well, first of all, it's, it's the discovery of new knowledge in biomedical sciences. With, uh, with people using the data and material from a biobank, they do research, they do studies, and they derive new knowledge uh, based on that. They derive conclusions based on existing data, or they discover new conclusions, they reach new conclusions based on the research they do on the existing data or the biological material. They use material to develop basic and innovative research results. They contribute to better diagnosis, prognosis, and prevention of diseases. They contribute to the discovery of biomarkers regarding disease predisposition or disease progression, enabling early intervention. They contribute to discovery of new and better medications. 
uh, some or all of these could not be uh, promoted um, and, and progressed without uh, having access to good quality material in biobanks or, or biobank-like collections, biorepositories. Uh, our motto is that we invest in the biobank, we invest in a healthier Cyprus, or we invest in a healthier world. Now, speaking of a biobank and speaking of medical research which engages people, human beings, it's, it's imperative we, we speak also about ethical, legal, and the social implications emanating from this uh, activity. Uh, there are sensitive data that are collected and archived. Um, there are data and material distributed to multiple researchers. Uh, data and material can go to researchers in your own country or in other countries around the world because researchers may reach out to you to use material from your, from your biobank. Uh, and it's not unusual for data to travel around the world or even for DNA to travel around the world provided that there, there is proper approval by the appropriate authorities. There is always uh, uh, genetic and genomics data generated, and we know that there is some sensitivity um, revolving around the use of genetics and genomics data. There is always a risk for linking or breaching of data. We, we always take care to minimize that risk, but there's always some exceptionally small risk for, for whatever reason. And of course, there's always a risk for illegal use of the data, something that we don't want to, and therefore we need to always take uh, the necessary measures to prevent uh, leaking or breaching of data or preventing the illegal use of data. Uh, coming out of that, and because of that, you know that uh, during the past couple of years, the general data protection regulation was established and implemented, and the biobanking activity follows strict standard operating procedures to align with various ISO standards, while at the same time uh, consider emerging ethical, legal, and societal issues in compliance with the GDPR and confidentiality considerations. Every, every biobank, every biorepository, and every authority or organization institute which keeps human data, sensitive human data, has to comply with GDPR and, and uh, proceed to impact assessment of the risks um, and because of the engagement into the use of sensitive human data. What is the procedure for a donor to enroll into a biobank? First of all, you have to decide on your own that you're interested in being a volunteer, a donor in a biobank. Nobody can, can uh, make you decide without your own free will. Either you're a healthy volunteer or a patient. Uh, your doctor can only, can only explain to you. Your doctor can encourage you uh, if, if he thinks it's to your benefit or to the benefit of medicine in general. And, and you decide on your own whether you're interested in becoming a member in a biobank. So once you decide you're interested, you will make a call or uh, apply through a website and, appoint, uh, and, and an appointment is going to be arranged with a biobank receptionist. So you visit the biobank and wait for a nurse to be assigned to you. Uh, we have uh, trained nurses in our biobank who know how to explain everything to you and how to uh, guide you through this, uh, th this procedure. So the nurse will inform you about the project, either the biobank project or other research projects. You will be asked to sign a consent form and complete the questionnaire with demographic and clinical data. So uh, 
depending on the project, there is a, a questionnaire where the clinical information and demographic data are recorded uh, to be used by researchers in a pseudonymized format. The nurse will give you a consultation on genetics if there is a necessity for that, in case you're a patient, for example, or somebody asking for specific information regarding any risks that may be in your family. And uh, the nurse will take you your body type measurements, blood pressure data, and, and, and else. Then she or he will take um, a sample for, from your blood, urine, or other biological type sample. As I said, in our biobank, we, we take uh, blood to, co to collect an archive DNA, plasma, serum, and urine in multiple articles. Uh, by participating in our biobank and many biobanks, you're also entitled to undergo some, um, some routine uh, clinical testing, something like a, a checkup. So uh, a small part of your, of your blood will be sent to a, a clinical laboratory and a battery of tests is going to, to be performed and the results are going to be communicated to you either through email or in person. Therefore, your participation uh, is accompanied with a, with a direct benefit as well. Although in many occasions, uh, research projects may or may not be accompanied with, uh, uh, with, with any benefit. Uh, being a member of a biobank, it's an absolutely voluntary and altruistic uh, act of action um, uh, because you really contribute to a better and wider scope of a benefit to, to the general society. Now, it is very, it is very important to spend uh, some time on what we call informed consent form. This uh, ICF is a document that accompanies the participation in any biobank and any research project. And sometimes it, it also accompanies um, your, your willingness to undergo a specific genetic test in the framework of a differential diagnosis of, of, of your disease. So every volunteer participant must be informed and sign the approved ICF approved by, by an ethics body. This ICF must provide information on the project. It must provide information on benefits and risks, if any. It must transpire a feeling of transparency and confidence and respect of privacy. It must demonstrate respect and behave with caution to vulnerable groups. You, you should appreciate that many people who participate in research projects have some sort of vulnerability. First of all, they, they are affected people. They are people who have a disease. And therefore, by definition, they are vulnerable in the sense that they may be misinformed, for example, that by participating, somebody is going to, sell, to solve all their problems, which is not, which is not true in, in, in many cases. And, 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 and in any case, uh, every, patient can be considered as a vulnerable person. Children under the age of 18 are vulnerable people, people who are perhaps poor with financial problems uh, may be vulnerable people. People of older ages may be considered vulnerable. So you have to be very careful on how you handle and explain to these people everything about the project they are going to enroll and participate. And if somebody is not in position to understand and comprehend what, what he's signing, uh, uh, per perhaps a, a parent or a custodian uh, should take over and sign for them. Uh, a legal guardian, for example, okay? And this ICF must explain the rights of the research participants under the GDPR including their rights to access and their rights to withdraw at any time. Every participant to a biobank or, or a research project has the right to ask 
any question about this project, he has access to any data regarding him or her anytime. He has the right to, uh, to enrich the data and he has the right to withdraw from the research at any time without having to give details as to why he would like to withdraw his interest. The ICF may support a concept of broad consent for participation in multiple research projects, or it may be of closer and restricted use in a particular program. So what does that mean? Uh, signing a broad consent means that your material is going to be used more or less without limitations to many different research projects. Okay, it's, this is what we call broad consent. Or uh, there are many occasions where the material is used for a specific project, for example, relating to the discovery of early biomarkers in kidney disease or early biomarkers in breast cancer. So this is, this is not of wider use. Uh, data and material which was given for a specific purpose cannot be used without uh, added permission uh, for, for a different project. So in conclusion, biobanks are useful sine qua non infrastructures that are changing the world of medicine and pharmaceutical approaches. They must follow strict procedures and high standards of quality and confidentiality. And every person should be given the opportunity to participate in biobanks and research projects voluntarily. What I, what I believe in is that every, every citizen should be explained and encouraged to participate in research projects. And every citizen should, uh, should behave in a way like a citizen scientist and have input to what projects should be pursued and what sensitivities are out there uh, by the society in solving problems relating to, to health. Uh, we, we know that without research, without research, there is no progress. It's as simple as that. Without doing medical research, without the participation of volunteers into research programs, there is no way to come up with new mitigations and new treatments for diseases. So you may consider becoming a volunteer in a biobank or, or, or a research project that you may be interested in. This is how we invest in a biobank and we invest in a healthier world. One very recent and good example of the worthiness of participating in research, in research projects is the COVID-19 pandemic. Only a year after the pandemic uh, ensued, uh, we had uh, we had approved vaccines. We had ready vaccines for, for, a, for a few reasons. Uh, I mean, we had ready vaccines within a year for, for, for various reasons. One was that technology was ready. Another was that the pharmaceutical companies and the biotechnologists and the scientists in general moved very, very quickly to develop the vaccine. But most importantly, there were thousands and thousands of people like you and me who voluntarily participated in the testing of these vaccines so that within less than a year, there were adequate data to, to support the safety and the effectiveness of these vaccines. And within the past couple of years, we know that many, many millions around the world have been vaccinated with these, uh, with these vaccines. So thank you very much for, for listening to me. And if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer it.